of breaking news in the murders of four Idaho college students. Four students and close friends found dead inside this home. Ethan Chapin. Ethan Chapin. A triplet born and raised here in Skagit County. And Ethan Chapin's mom. Stacy Chapin. Stacy Chapin. Chapin. Says the family is still trying to process their new normal. My name is Stacy Chapin and I'm Ethan's mom. Stacy, welcome to The Squeeze. Thank you. It's we good to be here today. We're so thankful to have you here on your first ever podcast. First ever. What was Ethan like? He just was this incredible kid. He just had this warm personality. Triplets. Yep. They, they had, each, had other. each other. I was having a hard time understanding like his being, his spiritual self. Like, yeah. what do I do with this kid? My aunt called me and she goes, you know, this might sound funny. Literally just tuck him under your arm like a football and carry him with you. You know what I mean? Mm. She was like, until you have time to figure out what to do with him. Physically, I've literally walked grief. He was just the kid that was like one of the very, very best for his siblings. The analogy of the football is he still there today is he... mm. um, but where is he i'm not sure where he is That's, he's up I in heaven is, somewhere absolutely. he's happy There was this spa that does nares and hair, hair and stuff, but they had a massage place in the back that was doing selling children out of it. It was a front for this place selling children. So that federal agent that goes, oh crap, he says it's closed down. They must have got tipped off that we were coming. That the whole place is closed. The spa's not even there anymore. And I said, no, stop, because I could feel it. I knew there were still children there. I knew it. I'm looking at this place that the kids used to be, this this spa area. And there was a restaurant. Felt I need to go in there. I went into the restaurant and I went right to the manager. And I said, hey, friends told me about a massage place here. I said, is this still here? And he said, you got an appointment? Freaking knew that place was mm. still there, right? Mm -hmm. I said, no, I don't have an appointment. He goes, oh, I don't know anything about it. I'm like, mm. no, for your... I went out front, different people walking by, and I'm just listening. There was this lady that was walking. She felt differently to me. I walked over to the lady, and I said, hey. I said, uh, you can help me with something? And she goes, what? I have an appointment for a massage here. It looks like they closed down. She goes, you have an appointment? I kind of lied. I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she makes a phone call, and a few minutes later, these big steel doors open. This madam is there. Me and my operators go in, tell her what we're looking for. She takes us up and around. We knew we were being watched. Whenever someone is kidnapped for years and then is finally able to escape and tell their story, I think a lot of the times they can leave you with more questions than answers. This was one of those for me. We're gonna be talking about Colleen Stan. This case is also commonly referred to as the girl in the box. So many twists and turns and all the things. I'm gonna try my best to say this story to the best of my ability, so buckle up. Let's go. Colleen Stan was only 20 years old when she was abducted and held captive by Cameron Hooker for seven years. This is one of the craziest, most insane, traumatizing abduction cases I've ever read of. Beware. Cameron Hooker's family moved around when he was little. As a child, he was described as a happy, normal kid. It was around 1968. His family got up and moved to Red Bluff, California. Around there, he was 16 years old, and that's when his social skills were pretty much non-existent. He was weird, quiet, hard to talk to, and preferred to spend most of his time on his own. When he was 16, he started developing weird fantasies and fetishes. He would fantasize about aggressively forcing himself onto girls who did not give him consent. That should tell you enough about Cameron's character. After graduating high school he thought it was a good idea to start acting out on these fantasies he was 19 at the time and that's when he met janice who was 15. janice was the baby of her family she had three older siblings she did not have a good relationship with them or with her parents her parents were very judgmental of her and her actions she grew up in a very strict and religious household so when she brought cameron home she thought her parents were absolutely not going to approve of him especially because he was 19 and she was 15 but they actually liked cameron and they were excited for her cameron would be very good to janice but he would be very good to her on purpose in hopes of getting her to trust him because then he would go on to manipulate her and convince her to act out on these weird gross fantasies that he had fantasies of doing things to a girl without her consent. And it worked. Janice would never consent. He would handcuff her, whip her, do violent, intimate things to her. Afterwards, he would be very kind. Janice just went along with it. They end up getting married a few years later, 1976. Janice goes to Cameron and says, hey, I want a baby. Cameron says, fine, I will give you a baby if in return I can have a sex slave. Seems like a fair deal, right? He tells Janice, I will give you a baby and then I will kidnap a woman and hold her captive for my pleasure and my fantasies. Janice says, okay, 
It's settled, Janice gets pregnant. Cameron starts prepping the basement for the person that he will eventually kidnap. He starts building all of these surfaces and all these contraptions to have a place to act out his fantasies. One of those being a box that I would say is the size of a coffin. It's designed to put a woman in there. He asks Janice to come downstairs and get in the box to make sure that a girl would fit in it. Janice gives birth and then they go out to find their victim. They go out on a family drive with their newborn baby and that's when they spot Colleen Stan. She's Stan on the side of the road hitchhiking. Colleen was 20 years old. She had a very happy little life. She had three sisters that were her best friends. Her family was from Riverside, California, but she had moved to Oregon. Oregon? Oregon? Is that how you say it? She moved there and her family stayed back in Riverside, California. She was back in town to surprise a friend for her birthday. She ends up hitchhiking and she's almost all the way there, but she has around 100 miles to go to the city where she wants to go. She's waiting on the side of the road. That's when she sees Cameron and Janice pull up and she thinks, oh, a young couple with a little baby, sure they are saved so she gets in the car all is good they stop at a gas station to get gas Colleen gets out of the car goes to the bathroom when she gets back in the car there's now a wooden box in the back seat next to her they keep driving all of a sudden Cameron says that he wants to stop by and look at some caves that are nearby in the area he turns off the highway down a dirt road he pulls over they're now in the middle of nowhere and gets out of the car Cameron pulls out a knife holds it to Colleen's throat and says you have to do whatever I want you to do or I will kill you this wooden box that had appeared next to Colleen after the gas station has a hole in it that looks like your head is supposed to go in there. Cameron blindfolds Colleen, puts the box on her head. Mind you, this box weighs around 20 pounds and then orders her to lay down in the backseat of the car and they drive off. She's terrified. Obviously, she is blindfolded. Her head is in this box that is filled with carpet to muffle any sound. And it's nighttime now. They drive back to Cameron's house and that's when he takes her to the basement. In the basement, he had put a beam on the ceiling to hang his victim. He hangs Colleen from the beam with her handcuffs and then strips her naked. And he starts whipping her. This entire time, Colleen has been screaming and crying. No one can hear her, unfortunately. Cameron asks Janice to come downstairs and they lay down on the ground underneath Colleen, who is hanging from the ceiling. They do the nasty under Colleen. They then put the head box on Colleen's head again, lay her down in the body-sized wooden box, chain her up, and leave her there all night. Colleen would remain in that box up to 22 to 23 hours a day for weeks. She would only be let out to feed her just enough to keep her alive, but she wouldn't go to the bathroom. She wouldn't shower. She was just laying down in this box blindfolded, chained, not able to see anything. Colleen's roommates call her parents and say that she never came back from her trip to California. Her parents get worried and make the drive from where they live in Riverside all the way to Red Bluff, California. That's around a nine hour drive. The routine in the Stan household is that Cameron would go to work, Janice would stay home taking care of their baby, and then he would come home from work go to the basement, go downstairs, assault Colleen for hours. He would abuse her and do all kinds of horrible, gross things to her. And the worst part is that whatever Cameron would want to use to torture her, he could just build. So there was no limits to the things that he was doing. January 1978, after being held captive for eight months, this is when Cameron allowed Colleen to take off the blindfold. Later that month is when Cameron approaches Colleen and tells her that he is part of the secret company called the company and it's made up of all these powerful people like law enforcement people that worked for the government and all these people who held a lot of power he said that they all kept victims for fun and for pleasure and that all these slaves were women that were tracked. So the company was watching all of their moves. He told Colleen that if she tried to escape or did anything, the company would find out and kill her and her entire family as well as her friends. He started referring to himself as her master and changed her name to K, just the letter K. February, 1978, they for some reason moved from a house to a trailer and they decided they were gonna keep Colleen's wooden box underneath a waterbed in the wooden frame of the bed. Cameron and Janice also had a second baby. Cameron knew that he had brainwashed Colleen enough for her to really believe this company was always watching her. He started to let her out of her box a little bit longer at a time, knowing that she was too scared to escape. In 1980, around three years after being abducted, as a Christmas present, Cameron tells Colleen she can call her family. This is the first time she has spoken to her family in three years. They assumed that she had ran off and was in a cult. She called to say that she was happy and they were just happy that she was still alive and assumed that she was in a cult. Well, 
they didn't want to ask too many questions because they didn't want her to be scared off and then just go MIA again. Cameron now starts to get cocky. He thinks he has so much power over Colleen. He goes to her and tells her that the company has been watching her and they're so proud of her because she's been so well behaved that as a reward, they're going to let her go home and visit her family. He tells her he's going to drive her home. He's going to walk into the house with her. She has to introduce him as her fiance. And that's exactly what they do. And they walk into the family's house. She introduces him under a fake name as her fiance. And then he leaves and she stays there for 24 hours and she does not say one thing. She's home. She's acting weird. Her parents, again, think that she's in a cult. They do not want to press it and risk asking the wrong questions and then her going no contact again. So they just let it be. Cameron then returns to pick her up. They take a picture together and then they leave. Three years pass. It's 1983 now. Cameron forces Colleen to go out and get a job. And guys, keep in mind, she is so convinced that this company is real. She thinks that if she says anything or does anything wrong, the company is going to murder all of her family. So she does not risk it. The job she got was as a cleaner. So her routine now is that she goes out, works, comes back home, gives all the money she earned to Cameron, gets abused and gets put back in that box. This is going well for Cameron. He thinks I'm doing such a good job. Why don't I get more slaves? He tells Colleen that he's going to go out and get more girls. He's going to bring them back and Colleen is going to train them on how to behave. He starts building a dungeon in the backyard to keep all these girls that he's planning on taking and Colleen is forced to help him build the dungeon. It's 1984 now, seven years of Colleen living this life, being held captive. Cameron decides that he wants to make Colleen his second wife. At this point, Janice, for the first time in seven years, starts to realize that this is wrong and she starts feeling guilty. It is then that Janice goes up to Colleen and tells her that the company does not exist and that everything Cameron had been saying is a lie. Colleen realizes no one is going to kill her family and she decides to leave. Cameron is not home, so she just walks out of the door. She walks to a bus station, calls her family, lets them know she's gonna come home. And in a weird turn of events, she calls Cameron, tells him that she is leaving. And what does Cameron do? He cries on the phone and begs her to stay. She doesn't, of course. Back home, three months after Colleen left, Janice is still carrying around this guilt. She goes to church and confesses to her pastor about everything. Everything Cameron had done, everything about Colleen spills the beans. Finally, someone with common sense, the pastor decides to call the police and let them know what he was just told. Police at first don't believe it. They think the story sounds so far-fetched until they start investigating it and see all of the evidence of everything Janice said. Cameron Hooker finally gets arrested and charged with abduction, false imprisonment, and at the trial, Janice and Colleen testify and get this. Janice says that before they abducted Colleen, Cameron had actually abducted a different girl and killed her. Unfortunately, that was so long ago. There's no evidence. There's no body. So Cameron cannot be charged for it. In trial, his defense said that Colleen could have left earlier that because she didn't, she was a willing participant and she wanted to be there. Obviously, the jury and the judge are like, you guys are all idiots. And Cameron is found guilty on all charges, sentenced to 104 years in prison. But get this, two crazy things. First of all, Janice was granted immunity for testifying against Cameron, so she did not get in trouble at all all. The second crazy thing, in March of 2021, Cameron Hooker became eligible for parole because that was the time when they were trying to reduce the prison population. The last update I could find was April 4th, 2024. There is, I think, still a trial waiting to be held. I think this is still getting just pushed back. It hasn't happened yet. It's a trial to determine if Cameron will continue to be deemed as a violent predator. He is deemed to be that. He will remain in prison, but if he's not, he will get released and put into a halfway home. Colleen since then was able to return to somewhat a normal life. She has actually gotten married and has a child now, so that's a happy ending, but yeah, I mean just absolutely crazy. So many You'd say these things out loud and it's hard to believe that they're true, but they are and it's crazy. Let me know what you guys think. I love you so, so much and thanks for watching. I was in the middle of doing my makeup and I got a text from my neighbor across the street and she just said, hey, are you okay? And my heart immediately dropped because I didn't know why I wouldn't be okay. Suspect gained access to the house to an unlocked window in the basement. Remember walking quietly up my stairs, and then I saw a man facing his back facing me, and I saw a gun.
And I just immediately ran down my stairs and ran out my window and was dialing 911. 23,000. There was 23,000 grape-related pregnancies in Texas in the first 18 months after Roe v. Wade was overturned. There's a seventh grade girl in Mississippi. She was assaulted in her own backyard, dropped down the seventh grade, forced to carry the baby to term. The nearest abortion clinic? New York. Today, Sunday, we had three mass shootings today, two mass shootings yesterday, three mass shootings the day before that. In South Dakota this weekend, there was a bunch of far-right extremists with the uh, German symbol, if you catch my drift. They were just walking around, checking it out, hanging, taking pictures. We broke some record high temperatures this weekend, too. Phoenix, 111 degrees. Las Vegas, 112 degrees. Death Valley, 122 degrees. Regardless of what you think of the current president, he's invested the most money ever in climate change, a trillion dollars. He signed the first half of gun reform we've seen in the last 30 years. He signed executive orders around abortion and wants to codify Roe. The other party doesn't want to do any of that. We're moving in the right direction, but we also have one of the lowest rates of voting in the developed world. None of us vote. We never vote. A lot of you complain about what I just said, but do you V-O-T-E? Because let's do that. Because I want to grow up in a, in a world where that stuff doesn't happen. Okay, guys, breaking news in the eight passengers case. Kevin Frankie, Ruby's husband, has officially filed for divorce. Now, the petition is sealed, but both sides must not harass each other, commit domestic violence against each other, or interfere with the other party's insurance during the proceedings. It also says that Kevin and Ruby are not allowed to talk negatively about each other in front of their children, and Ruby and Jody's court hearings in their criminal cases still have not been scheduled. But when there are more updates, I will definitely be following it. So make sure that if you're not following the podcast yet, you are following along with with our Instagram where we can give you faster updates in real time like this one. 20 first graders who died in the Sandy Hook massacre were honored last night as their classmates graduated from high school. About 60 of this year's 330 graduates at Newtown High School survived that attack back in 2012 that also killed six adults. The names of all 20 student victims were read aloud at last night's graduation followed by a moment of silence. Some members of the class of 2024 spoke before the ceremony, saying their memories of their classmates are still very vivid. I think we can't forget about that there is a whole chunk of our class missing. And so going into graduation, we all have very mixed emotions, trying to be excited for ourselves and this accomplishment that we've worked so hard for, but also those who aren't able to share it with us who should have been able to. Betterstein had to pay $250 to claim her son's body, basically buy him back from the people who killed him and swept it under the rug. And even still, they didn't tell her where she could find him at first. It wasn't until early October that she was finally able to visit her son's grave. And loved ones were by her side for that, and they stood together in prayer, mourning this incredibly devastating loss. And that's what's so sick about all of this. So many cases like this, where you're already facing such unimaginable pain and loss, and then you have to deal with this corruption and- Discrimination. Yes. Mm -hmm. on top of it you know you're trying to heal from multiple things at once and how can you even really grieve and start to move on with your life and process this massive loss when you're also trying to fight for justice against those that are there supposedly to protect you which is the worst standing by her son's grave betterstein said dexter i want to tell you i am so sorry i'm so sorry this happened to you but mama didn't know mama didn't know i always loved you and I miss you. Farewell, baby. Farewell. So unbelievably sad. How are private investigators still in business when there are like women in their 20s outworking them with less information? Like I can just give any of my girlfriends a first name and a random fact about someone and they will come back with basically an FBI profile of that person. Like their social security number, any health issues in the family, like whether or not they got in a fight with their sibling when they were four years old. And I get that for free. Kevin Frankie, the husband of now disgraced YouTube vlogger Ruby Frankie, who has been arrested for child abuse, reportedly tried to have his daughter, Sherry, arrested for burglary because he argued she is not allowed in the home. 
20-year-old Sherry is a student at BYU, and she cut ties with her family last year after her mother began working with Jody Hildebrandt on their self-improvement program called Connections. Sherry has previously expressed concern for her younger siblings. In September 2022, Sherry asked the Springville police to check on her younger siblings, who she said had been left home alone for five days to make sure they had enough food for the extended period of time. At the time, police responded and the kids appeared to be home, but no one answered the door. On August 30th, 2023, the day of Ruby Frankie's arrest, the Utah Division of Child and Family Services requested that the Springville police search for the Frankie's two middle daughters at their home address. Responding officers reportedly spent several minutes knocking on the Frankie's door, but no one answered and all the windows were covered by blinds or curtains, so they couldn't tell what was going on inside. After getting a warrant, officers broke through the home's front door, but found the home unoccupied. Around the same time, Sherry Frankie had arrived at a neighbor's house. She told authorities that one of her sisters, who had not yet been found, may be at a nearby recreational center, but when police contacted the center, they were told the girl had been picked up because of a, quote, family emergency. The girls were eventually found with the woman who had stopped by the recreational center to pick them up, and this woman was identified as an employee of Connections. This woman told authorities that Ruby Frankie had asked her around noon that day to pick up the girls because of the unspecified family emergency. After picking one of the girls up at the recreation center and another from a different location, the employees took the girls out for lunch and ice cream, and she told police that she had no idea authorities had been looking for them. After taking them to lunch, she brought the girls to her home, and it was not an odd request for her to bring them to her home since the girls often did housework and chores for her. An officer and a DCFS worker then spoke with the two girls on the employee's front porch, and the worker initially told them that they would be taken to stay with their sister, Sherry, but the girls told authorities that they did not want to go with Sherry and instead preferred to stay with the employee. When they tried to search one of the girls' backpacks, the girl became very defiant, telling authorities, quote, they needed a warrant to do that. The officer explained that a warrant wasn't needed because she and her sister were being placed into state custody and this was a precautionary search. But nothing of note was found in the bag and the two girls were turned over to DCFS. On September 1st, two days after Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt's arrest, Ruby's husband Kevin alleged that his daughter Sherry Frankie had broken into the family's Springville home. Kevin told police that he believed the home had been burglarized because the front door was kicked in and that several electronics were missing, which contained his electronic journals. He told an officer that he suspected his eldest daughter was responsible, citing a statement he alleged Sherry Frankie had made in an unspecified court hearing that day. The officer then explained to Kevin that the door was breached when Springville police entered the home on August 30th while serving the DCFS warrant. The officer also told Kevin that police went with Sherry to the home on August 31st to retrieve personal items for two of her siblings, but Kevin did not seem to think that this was relevant. Kevin then stated that Sherry is not allowed in the home and that he believes she entered unlawfully and he wants her charged with burglary. Police then contacted Sherry and she returned the items to the police station. These items included passports for Ruby and Kevin and her 18-year-old brother, along with three tablets, three cell phones, three cameras, and a stack of written journals. Sherry told authorities that she did not intend to deprive her father of the items, and an officer told Kevin that police would not be recommending any charges be filed against Sherry. According to an officer, Kevin was displeased with this answer and advised that they would be hearing from his attorney. The officer also noted that Kevin later came to the police station to pick up the items that Sherry had returned. It's unclear what exactly Kevin Frankie was hoping to get out of trying to get his daughter charged for burglary, other than possibly just getting those items back. But as officers explained to Kevin, she did not take those with malintent, and officers were with her when she went into the home to take them. And she returned them to the police station when asked. It is just a very confusing situation, and things just keep getting piled on top of this case. I'll keep you guys updated with whatever happens next. Now this is gold. A teenager leaves his parents on a Caribbean island to get back to the cruise on time. They miss the departure by a lot. 
with a teenager saying that their parents recently gifted them a family cruise in honor of turning 18 and graduating high school. Anticipating that their parents might not be able to stick to the planned nature of a cruise, they write that they told them that if we went on excursions, we had to follow the schedule no matter what. Well, it was a week-long cruise and they would not head back to the ship when I said it was time to go. They were busy shopping and bargaining with the locals. I finally said that I was heading back to the ship and my mom waved me off. They missed the departure by a lot, like 45 minutes. They then got a hold of me through WhatsApp and they wanted to know why I didn't get the boat to wait for them. Yes, why didn't your teenager just go and chat with the captain and hold thousands of people up for you? And eventually they ended up having to fly to the next port from there and it was really expensive. And they were pissed at me for leaving them behind. Your teenager did not leave you behind. The ship did not leave you behind. You were not left behind. You failed to follow the very explicit clear instructions and you faced the natural consequences of your actions. A body was found in the ventilation system in a Macomb Community College building. According to Macomb Police, the body was found on the college's center campus. It was found Sunday night after a foul odor was reported to be coming from the Macomb Center for the Performing Arts. Right now, they don't suspect any foul play. And the Macomb College Police Chief William Livin said, At this point, it is important to remember that this is an ongoing investigation with the goal to understand the circumstances. End quote. Levens also said at this time, they're not going to release the name of the individual and are working on notifying their family. Breaking news, the FBI has now released all 366 pages into the Gabby Petito Brian Laundry case. Within that is a never before seen letter written from Gabby to Brian. In total, the letter is two pages long. It reads, quote, Brian, you know how much I love you, so I am writing this with love. Just please stop crying and calling me names because we're a team and I'm here with you. I'm always going to have your back. I love you and this hurts so much. So you in pain is killing me. I'm not trying to be negative, but I'm frustrated there's not more I can do. In addition to that, there was a ton of evidence photos that were collected from Brian Laundrie's home as well as Gabby Petito's van. In this one, you can see they laid out a bunch of the stickers collected along the trip. This is a bag belonging to Gabby with all of her things inside of it in addition to a pair of shoes, and another bag belonging to Gabby. In addition to those items, there was also a black and white book bag, and another set of shoes. There was also a composition book inside. In the receipt for property, you can see all of the items collected. They include three photographs and a black iPhone 7, an iPhone box, and a Western digital hard drive. It also included notebooks and greeting cards along with a hair fiber and fingernails. It also states that where Gabby was found near her body, there were found two arrows. In addition to that, next to her was a revolver speed loader containing ammunition. However, they were not able to open the speed loader and gain additional information regarding the ammunition inside. They also released the evidence log for which they found Brian Laundry. Pause to read. There are a lot more pages to this section, however, they are all human remains. To stay up to date on this case, make sure you click the playlist below. I'll keep you guys updated. What do you think? Drop in the comments. Prosecutors have officially submitted the disputed DNA evidence that Brian Koberger has been asking for to the court. After four University of Idaho students were murdered last November, prosecutors say that police used investigative genetic genealogy, or IgG, to generate leads in the case. They did not use this to obtain warrants, but just to generate leads. This was in part what led them to Brian Koberger, and they allegedly confirmed a match between a DNA sample on a knife sheath found at the crime scene to Koberger's cheek swab after he was arrested. Last week, Prosecutor Bill Thompson wrote in a court filing that his office had submitted the IgG information in its possession, custody, or control. The judge on the case, Judge John Judge, had ruled back in October that the prosecution was to share the IgG evidence with him for an in-camera review, aka an inspection by the judge done in private. The judge said the state's argument that the IgG investigation is wholly irrelevant since it was not used in obtaining any warrants and will not be used in trial is well supported. Nonetheless, Koberger is entitled entitled to view at least some of the IgG information in preparing his defense, even if it may ultimately be found to be irrelevant. 
The judge will now be examining the IgG evidence and decide how much, if any, should be shared with the defense. For context, Koberger and his defense have been fighting for access to this DNA evidence for months as they are trying to get any evidence they can disqualified from use against him. Now that the judge has the evidence, he will decide how much can be turned over to the defense. Frankie, how do you plead to count one, aggravated child abuse, a second degree felony? Guilty. To count three, aggravated child abuse, a second degree felony? Guilty. To count five, aggravated child abuse, a second degree felony? Guilty. And to count six, aggravated child abuse, a second degree felony? With my deepest regret and sorrow for my family and my children, guilty. There is a factual basis set forth in the agreement that is a stipulation. Look through the windshield. Oh! It's bad. Hold on, did everyone see that? It's bad. Okay, everyone watch, everyone watch. Take the keys out of the ignition. Turn the car! They're taking off northbound. Oh my gosh. Keep in mind, he hit a cop car. Yeah. I need EMS now, squad involved. Stop! Get back here! Stop! Oh, I would not be running Stop from right her. Now. Okay, so pause just for a sec. I just want to clarify that the reason she's going so hard is because she knows he just hit a cop. Yeah. Some of the alleged claims of neglect reported on this 911 call made by their oldest daughter, 20-year-old Sherry Frankie, back in September 2022. Hi, um, my name is Sherry Frankie. My four younger siblings are living in Springville, and my neighbors have been telling me that they have been left home alone for about four or five days. Records indicating police responded to the Frankie home more than a dozen times in the last few years, as early as 2018, and a wellness check in 2022. Authorities arresting Ruby and her business partner in connections, Jody Hildebrand. The two now face six counts each of felony child abuse, each charge carrying a penalty of 15 years in prison. The criminal side could actually have a lot of influence on the family case because these are charges related to child abuse, child neglect. And when family judges are looking to determine where kids should have custody, where they should live, those types of charges can heavily affect that determination. Now, we reached out to attorneys for both Ruby and Kevin Frankie about their custody battle, but have not heard back. Legal experts say, though, that the two adult Frankie children could apply for custody themselves. Meanwhile, Ruby Frankie and her business partner and co-defendant, Jody Hildebrand, were denied bail, or are in jail as the case unfolds. Guys? Mm -hmm. This is a terrifying, gruesome true crime case that is going to ruin your day in more ways than one. After a totally normal night out with friends, 27-year-old Allison Botha drove back to her apartment. She parked her car in a different place than she usually parked, 
but as soon as she did park, a man with a weapon forced himself into her car and forced Allison into the passenger seat. Before Allison could even fully understand what was going on because it happened so fast, she's now kidnapped in her own vehicle and her kidnapper is driving her car down the road. The kidnapper was telling Allison that he was not going to hurt her, but when the kidnapper drove into a second location and picked up an accomplice, it became clear to Allison that these men had a sinister plan for her. What happened to 27-year-old Allison Botha next is extremely graphic and gruesome, so just a warning, don't be like eating snacks or anything during this video. Two men drove her into a secluded area and parked her car there, and they told her, this is where we're going to SAU now, and then they asked her if she was going to resist, and to survive, she told them, no, I won't resist. After both men brutally essayed Allison, they decided that then they were going to end her life. Allison was stabbed over 30 times in her stomach, like 35, 37 times. There were so many stabs that they actually couldn't determine how many there was. And then she survived that somehow. So then the men slashed her throat 16 times. There were over 50 cut marks on Allison's body. And then one of the men asked the other one if he thought that Allison was dead now, and that man responded, yes, she's definitely dead. Nobody could survive that. What they did not know is Allison did survive that, and she was playing dead, listening to everything they were saying, including the real names, the first names. So when the attackers drove off, Allison was laying there and she knew that she was probably going to die. She was laying in the sand, no clothes, bleeding everywhere, but she found the strength to write her attacker's names in the sand with her finger. And then under that, she wrote, I love mom. So when they found her body, her mom would know that she was thinking about her. That absolutely tore me up when I read that, by the way. I couldn't even imagine the fear and pain that Allison was feeling while she was lying there, knowing that she was probably going to die. But then the unthinkable happened. Allison didn't die and she found the strength to get up and get herself to somewhere, somewhere safe with someone that would help her. But once Allison stood up, she realized how severe her injuries actually were. Because of all the injuries to Allison's stomach, her intestines were outside of her body. So she had to like hold her one hand here to keep her insides like inside of her body. Then she's realizing that her head keeps falling back and that's because due to all the cuts to her neck, she was nearly decapitated. Her head is hanging on like by a string. So with one hand, she's holding her stomach to keep her intestines from coming out. And then with her other hand, she's holding her head in place and she starts walking down the road like that. The first car to drive by and see Allison, and honestly, I couldn't even imagine what she probably looked like, did stop, but then changed their mind and kept driving down the road. But the next car to drive by luckily did stop to help Allison. A gentleman that was in that car named Tian was like an actual angel. He was actually in school studying to become a vet. So he had, you know, like some kind of medical education at this time. He did his best to give her medical and emotional help while they waited for the paramedics to arrive, which, you know, for some reason it took almost two hours for the ambulance to get there and like four phone calls. But regardless, he was doing his best to keep her awake during that time. He was even telling her, you have the most beautiful eyes, please keep them open. And by some miracle, Alison Vata did survive this gruesome, awful attack. And she actually made an almost full recovery as well. I mean, physically. I'm sure the mental wounds took longer to heal than the physical ones. Allison was quickly able to identify her attackers, these scum of the earth rats, Franz and Tians. These men were serial R-worders and had recently been arrested for three total counts of essaying women, but the judge had released them with no bail or anything right before Allison's attack um, while they awaited their trials. It's actually said that these I'm not even gonna call them men. They're scummy, scummy rats. 
were confused that they were being arrested with attempted murder because they could not believe that Allison survived all those wounds that they inflicted on her. Tians was sentenced to life in prison plus 25 years without the possibility of parole and Franz was sentenced to three life sentences without the possibility of parole. But sadly, and we've talked about this before, sometimes life in prison without the possibility of parole does not mean life in prison without the possibility of parole because only last year in July of 2023, it was decided that these scummy, scummy rats would be released from prison. So right now, at this very minute, they are out somewhere in the world, free with the rest of us. I am so sick of covering cases with endings like this. It's such a slap in the face to Allison and her bravery and strength to release the men that did that to her. Whoever was in charge of making that decision, you are scummy, scummy rats, just like the ends and friends. If you guys did watch to end this video, thank you so, so much for listening to Allison's story. It's such a crazy survival story, and we love sharing survival stories of like badass women that survive some of the most terrifying, gruesome things that imaginable. I honestly couldn't be me. I don't know if I could survive that. I'm going to be completely honest, but Allison did, and it's really, really cool that you guys stuck around to listen to her story. If you guys did see this, because we have been covering some longer videos and you guys have been liking it and I like it too, leave some blue, gold, and orange emojis so I know that you guys saw this and I will see you guys tomorrow and I love you guys so, so much. Gypsy Rose Blanchard was released from prison this morning, and upon her release, she was picked up by her husband, Ryan Scott Anderson. Ryan and a film crew were seen at the prison picking her up at 3.30 this morning. It's been reported that they are filming for an upcoming Lifetime docuseries. The car Ryan Anderson was driving is a white Cadillac with a wrestling-themed Bret Hart license plate that reads Hitman. The couple went to a nearby hotel, presumably to sleep, since she was essentially released in the middle of the night. Then a few hours later, once the sun was up, Gypsy was seen publicly for the first time. She was carrying some plastic bags with belongings inside, a rolling suitcase, and a pillow. And her husband was seen also rolling a large suitcase towards his car, with the film crew still in the background. She was also seen only wearing socks, but a while later, she was spotted at a shoe warehouse buying new shoes, Skechers to be exact. A video of them leaving the store was also shared with the camera crew still with them. It was good. Got these new shoes. They look great. Do you have any plans? Lots of them. Anything specifically? Nope. All right. Gypsy seems to be doing well so far and hopefully with the support of her husband and her family, she will be able to live her best life.